Hello and welcome. We're glad you're viewing our gardening video today. It was created by the Walton County Master Gardener Extension Volunteers to serve as a companion resource for our Gardening with the MGs series of presentations presented at local libraries. Today our video in the Edible Gardening series will be Totally Tomatoes. In the United States, tomatoes are a favorite vegetable. Or is it a fruit? Well, the scientists say that tomatoes, which are the products of the tomato plant, are indeed true fruits as they're developed from the ovary in the base of the flower and contain the seeds of the plant. For cooks, however, fruits such as tomatoes and bean pods are considered vegetables since they are typically used in savory rather than sweet dishes. And in a 19th century customs law case, the justices of the United States Supreme Court ruled that tomatoes were vegetables and therefore subject to the import tax in question. Tomatoes were first cultivated in Mesoamerica, which is today's Mexico, Central, and South America, where the original fruits were yellow and not red. Then the seeds were taken back to Europe by the conquistadors and subsequent explorers. Considered poisonous plants because the leaves and stems can be toxic in varying degrees, they were first used ornamentally until the late 17th century when recipes were recorded in Naples. The earliest reference to tomatoes being grown in British North America is from around 1710 when they were found in what is today South Carolina. They may have been introduced there from the Caribbean. Thomas Jefferson, who ate tomatoes during his time in Paris, sent some seeds back to America in the late 1700s. We find a stock market listing and the first ketchup recipe in 1812 through 1818 where the credit is given to Maine housewives as the originators of the first ketchup. Alexander Livingston was the first person who succeeded in upgrading the wild tomato by developing different breeds and stabilizing the plants. Campbell's was the first large commercial introduction of tomato soup in cans and the success of this product led to a new interest in home gardening of the tomato plant. And then in the early 30s, George Washington Carver of Tuskegee University implemented an extensive research program for growing the tomato in home gardens. If you're watching this video, you probably want to know the answer to the question, how can I grow the best tomatoes in my own home garden? Well, Master Gardeners have some hints for you. Be realistic, educate yourself, set appropriate goals, and take very good notes. Here are the things that you as a home gardener can control, and we will discuss these in the next sections. It's good to know that there are some things that are outside of control of the home gardener. The first one for you to consider is the weather. And secondly, remember, Mother Nature is always the boss. So do as most experienced gardeners do. Do the best you can and enjoy the run. So let's talk about the things that you as a home gardener can control. Just like in the world of real estate, where your tomatoes will grow is all about location, location, location. It's also about learning and using information provided by your soil test. And as most gardeners will tell you, your best garden started last year. When focusing on the location where your tomatoes will be growing, remember the key ingredient to your success is the sun. As a Master Gardener mentor of mine once said, don't lie to yourself about the amount of sun your garden receives. Your tomatoes will want to receive 6 to 10 hours of sun each day, with 8 hours being the optimum. 
for success with tomatoes. Sunshine needs to be consistent, if not constant. Be sure to monitor the amount of sunlight since that may change over the growing season, which here in Georgia runs from the first part of April to the end of October. And select varieties based on your location, those that are re recommended for your USDA zone. Our zone here in Walton County is Zone 8A. The next question you will want to answer about the location of where your tomatoes will grow is where's the water? Tomatoes are known as thirsty beasts. They require at minimum one inch of water a week. They need consistent moisture. It's key to harvesting well-formed fruit and keeping blossom end rot at bay. Use drip irrigation or soaker hoses in the morning so that the plants are not exposed to water droplets on the leaves or stems and the roots have the benefit of high levels of moisture throughout the day. As any master gardener will tell you, don't guess, soil test. Please visit your county extension office to get your soil sample bags and the test kits that will give you all the information about collecting the soil samples and submitting them. So why do we say soil test? Well, the first thing we need to talk about in relation to soil test is the pH. The pH scale measures how acidic or basic a uh, substance is. The pH scale ranges from 0 to 14 with a pH of 7 is neutral. If it's less than 7 it's considered acidic and greater than 7 it's considered basic. Unimproved Georgia clay soils tend to be quite acidic but no one can tell what their pH level is or what it needs to adjust it correctly simply by looking at it. Soil testing is the answer. There will be different recommendations based on the plants to be grown. For instance, no lime would be re recommended in a sample with a pH of 5.0 for azaleas as they are considered acid loving plants. But a lot of lime is needed to raise a soil pH of 5.0 to a range of 6.2 to 6.8, which is the range that is preferred by tomatoes. Remember, plants are unable to absorb some nutrients, even if they're abundant in the soil, unless the pH is in the correct range for that plant. Let's do a little review of some fertilizer basics. All fertilizer containers have the ratio for the active ingredients contained in them on the label. It always means the same three macronutrients, N, P, K, in the same order. N is for nitrogen, which is good for the stem, leaves, and stalk of your tomato plants. Don't feed your plants too much nitrogen, however, because the green parts of the plant will thrive, while the tomatoes will be very small or non-existent. If your tomato plant's lower leaves turn yellow or the plant's growth is stunted, it likely isn't getting enough nitrogen. Nitrogen sources include compost, fully rotted manure, and commercial fertilizer. The P stands for phosphorus, which promotes plant growth and health by helping it develop a strong root system and it prevents disease. Stunted growth and leaves that turn purple on the undersides are signs of a phosphorus deficiency. Feed your tomato plants phosphorus through composted manure, bone meal, and commercial fertilizer. The K stands for potassium, which helps tomato plants reach their full potential in growth and hardiness. It also helps them be disease resistant. Stunted growth, undersized plants, few tomatoes, or yellow spots on the leaves are all signs of a potassium deficiency. Potassium sources include wood ashes, compost, and commercial fertilizer. Remember, don't over-fertilize, especially with nitrogen, and always follow 
the soil test recommendations, and label directions. While the macronutrients of NPK are important, we need to discuss at least one micronutrient, calcium. Your tomato plant won't develop without calcium. This nutrient also helps prevent a common tomato problem, blossom end rot. It is not contained in most commercial fertilizers, but probably is in fertilizers specifically made for tomatoes. If you're in doubt, check the label to confirm. Other sources of calcium include clean chicken egg shells, bone meal, and ground limestone. Remember, tomato plants with good root structures and consistent water should not have calcium deficiencies. Now for the all-important question. When do I fertilize my tomatoes? If you did a soil test, your report will tell you both when and how much to fertilize your tomatoes. But if no soil test was done, apply a balanced fertilizer, usually quoted as 10-10-10, and follow the label instructions. Do incorporate this into the top six to nine inches of soil, and it's best done three to four weeks before you transplant your tomatoes. If you're growing your tomatoes almost exclusively in containers, be sure to use a quality potting medium, which probably contains a slow release fertilizer. You can add a starter solution of fertilizer, usually one quarter to one half strength, when you plant your tomatoes. And then you'll want to fertilize again when you see the flowers bloom, when the fruit is golf ball size, and then four to six weeks later. It's just as important to remember not to over fertilize as it is to under fertilize plants, especially where the element nitrogen is concerned. Most gardeners live by the maxim that this year's garden started last year. And what that translates into is that fall cleanup of the garden is essential, removing any debris and diseased plants. Although some gardeners do, I personally don't compost remains of my tomato crop due to a high rate of disease in our growing area. Fall is actually the best time to perform soil testing so that you can amend according to the soil test recommendations and the worms in the amendments have time to do their jobs. Remember, make a note of where you planted your tomatoes each year and don't plant members of the nightshade family in that location for the next three to four years. The nightshade family includes tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and eggplants, along with petunias. There are so many choices when it comes to growing tomatoes, and we will cover them in the next sections. In this section, we will be talking about tomatoes in terms of their growth habits. Have you ever heard the terms indeterminate and determinate? Indeterminate tomatoes will grow continuously from spring through fall and by the end of the season can reach 10 feet or more in height, although 6 feet is normal. Indeterminates will bloom, set new fruit, and ripen fruit throughout the season. By the end of the season, a large vine may have produced more than a bushel of tomatoes and will still have green fruits that can be ripened indoors. Indeterminate varieties require substantial staking for support and benefit greatly from the extra support that cages can provide. Because of their long and productive growing season, indeterminate varieties are said to be good for both home gardens as well as for farmers markets. Examples that you may have heard of are German Johnson, Brandywine, Better Boy, Lemon Boy, and Super Sweet 100. Determinate tomatoes are frequently called bush because of their compact form. The bush-like plants grow to a certain size, produce flowers and fruit, 
and they typically top off at a specific height, usually around four or five feet, shorter than most indeterminate varieties. All the fruits ripen in a short period of time of over about two weeks. Once the fruit has ripened, that plant is done. It's made its seed and it won't produce any more fruit. The plant will grow very little, if at all, after producing tomatoes, and the leaves may begin to turn yellow after fruit production, and that plant will start to wither. They require a limited amount of staking for support and are perfectly suited for container planting. Because determinate varieties produce their crops over a short period, they're also perfect for canning as well as making paste and sauces. Some examples that you may know are Celebrity, Better Bush, and Roma. Although Celebrity will top off at a specific height like a determinate variety, it will continue producing until frost, similar to indeterminate tomatoes. When making your choice of tomato seeds or transplants, growth habits are important to know, but it's also important to know what shape and size you want, as the names don't always reflect the size and shape of the tomato plant. Are you looking for a slicing or a globe tomato? That would be perfect for a sandwich or a single serving. Are you looking for a beefsteak tomato? Also good for a sandwich. If you're looking for a sauce or a canning tomato, think in terms of a plum, a pear, or a paste. And if you like tomatoes in your salad, look for cherry tomatoes or grape tomatoes. Another choice to consider when selecting your tomatoes is whether you would like an heirloom or a hybrid tomato. Heirloom tomatoes are often the ones that have been cultivated for at least three generations, although some people do refer to those tomatoes as having been around since prior to World War II. A better term for heirloom tomatoes is actually open pollinated, as they do come true to type from their own seed, and they're popular for seed savers. Heirlooms are also popular because people believe their taste is better and they have such unique shapes and colors. Do note, however, that because they can take longer to mature and they do sometimes produce fewer fruit on the plants, their productivity can be less. Some notables include Brandywine, Mortgage Lifter, and German Johnson. Hybrid tomato plants combine two different varieties of tomato plant to produce a cultivated variety with beneficial traits from both of its parents. Some of the benefits of hybrid tomatoes include higher yields, improved disease resistance, higher quality fruit in terms of strength of stems or consistency of size, shape, and production. Some names of hybrid tomatoes that you may be familiar with include Celebrity, Better Boy, Super Sweet 100, Early Girl, and Sun Goal, which is pictured on the slide. When choosing tomatoes for your garden, it may be wise to select varieties that have shown resistance to several diseases that plague tomato plants in our growing area. Let's say you're considering growing Big Beef, a hybrid tomato variety that is recommended for growing in Georgia home gardens. And you notice that on the transplant tag are the initials VFFNTA. What does that mean? That means that Big Beef has shown disease resistance to Verticillium wilt, Fusarium wilt F1 and F2, root knot nematodes, tobacco mosaic virus, and Altenaria stem canker.
Now you may be wondering, what tomatoes do I plant in my Georgia home garden? Some examples include Better Boy, Celebrity, The Mountain Series, Early Girl, Juliet, and the one we just talked about, Big Beef. You can find these examples and others in the excellent UGA Extension Bulletin 1271 Georgia Homegrown Tomatoes. We'll talk more about this bulletin later. In thinking about your options, you may be asking yourself, should I start from seed or should I buy transplants? Well, seeds, you will get more varieties and it's typically less expensive, but you may have passed the point in the growing year when seeds would be the recommended option. At this point, you may want to get your transplants from garden centers or from farmers markets. You can get tried and true varieties and this allows you to jump right in and plant. So it's time to choose your tomato transplants. When you go to the garden center, look for the bright green plants, the ones that have the leaves and stems that are consistently colored. Select only healthy transplants for planting in your garden. Bigger isn't always better with tomato transplants. Think in terms of a shorter plant rather than a taller, leggier plant. And do check the soil in the pot of the transplant. You want to avoid dry or root-bound plants, which may not have been treated well. Once you've selected healthy plants for your garden, it's time to transplant. Remember the adage to think deep, high, and wide. You will want to plant your tomatoes deeply as they develop roots all along their stems. So set the transplants down to the first set of true leaves near the soil surface. Now is the time to stake, cage, or trellis your tomato plants. Although it requires more work initially, staking makes caring for tomatoes easier and keeps the plant's leaves from contacting the ground and possibly introducing disease. This in turn produces higher quality fruit. When planting, space your tomatoes 18 to 30 inches apart, depending on the cultivar recommendation, in rows four to six feet apart, depending on whether you have staked, caged, or trellised your plants. All of this will help provide the good air circulation that helps your tomato plants grow and be as healthy as possible. Again, remember, tomatoes are thirsty beasts, so it's time to water well when you plant them. Once your plants are in the ground, it's time to think about giving them the care they need in order to thrive. This includes consistent watering. We do recommend that for the first two weeks, you water the tomato plants twice a week. Make sure that they receive at least one inch of water every week thereafter. This can be by rainfall or by drip or soaker hose. Tomatoes are medium feeders and they will require fertilizer beyond the initial starter solution. You can do this by side dressing with a balanced product such as 101010 following the label directions when the tomatoes have start to set fruit, when the fruit is golf ball size, and then every four to six weeks thereafter throughout the long growing season. Now is the time to think about removing suckers on the indeterminate varieties. Suckers are those side shoots that grow in the axle between the main stem and the leaves. Determinate 
tomatoes need no pruning other than removing suckers below the first flower cluster because pruning won't affect their fruit size or plant vigor. Indeterminate tomatoes, though, can have from one to many stems, although four is probably the most that we would recommend. The fewer the stems, the fewer but the larger the fruits are produced and the less room the plant needs in the garden. Tomatoes benefit from mulch being placed around their stems. Mulching should be done soon after transplanting. Using a material such as weed-free straw, chopped leaves, or compost. This helps conserve moisture and reduces weed growth. Apply mulch to a depth of two to three inches. In my own garden, I like to use newspaper as an effective mulch. Lay the newspaper about three sheets thick around plants to act as a weed barrier, and then you can place an organic mulch on top of the paper. As much as we all love our tomatoes, there will be problems during the long growing season in Georgia. Let's divide those into things we can prevent by taking action. These include first of all choosing disease resistant varieties as we've talked about. Secondly, space those transplants properly and do practice crop rotation of the nightshade family. Then there are the reactions, the things that we can do to take care of problems such as diseases, pests, and other deficiencies. The two things we can do for this is to learn to recognize the most common and if you have any questions, contact your local county extension office. Diseases and viruses on tomatoes can be a real problem for the Georgia home gardener. Cultural practices such as starting with a clean garden, don't overhead water, and removing all diseased plant parts from the garden from last year will go a long way in preventing disease problems. It makes more sense to maintain a healthy plant and prevent disease problems than to rely on spraying multiple chemicals for control. There is one disease that is a serious problem for our area. So let's cover that one. Blossom in rot. There on the screen you see a picture of an example its main symptom is a dark, sunken, water-soaked area at the blossom end of the fruit. It's a physiological disorder that is associated with a low concentration of calcium in the fruit. It is induced more often when there's drought stress followed by excessive soil moisture, so inconsistent watering. These fluctuations reduce the uptake and movement of the available calcium. Although tomatoes are fairly tolerant of insect damage, there will occasionally be trouble from some common garden pests, such as you see there on the screen. Insecticidal soap, Bt, and neem oil can be used by many organic gardeners with a fair success. A general purpose garden insecticide applied according to label directions will control most of the pests, but we ask that you use care when spraying because these pesticides will also kill many of the beneficial insects that are protecting your garden naturally. One example of both of these can be found in a tomato hornworm, and you see there on the screen a picture of this large, is usually two to three inches long when fully grown, green caterpillar that has a horn protruding from the top rear end of the worm, thus giving him his name. The tomato horn worms will feed on the leaves and the fruit and they can quickly defoliate a plant and ruin developing fruit. 
However, if you see a tomato hornworm with small white cocoons protruding, such as that picture illustrates, leave them alone. These structures are actually the pupa of parasitic insects that will help control the hornworm population in your garden. And the hornworm that you see wearing them is already doomed. Unfortunately, home gardeners cannot possibly recognize all the common diseases or pests of tomatoes. We do want to encourage you when you have questions to check out research-based sites. And a good one for you to check out is a visual-based site from Texas A&M. The address for that site is now showing on the screen. Soon it will be time to think about harvesting your tomatoes. The days to harvest that you see on the seed packets actually mean the days from transplanting the plants into the garden or the container. Tomatoes will produce between 50 and 90 degrees, so don't be concerned when our temperatures go above 90 that the tomato has stopped flowering and therefore setting fruit. They will come back. Allow the fruit to ripen on the vine for the best flavor, but if you're concerned about pests, especially squirrels, you can harvest the fruit after it begins to color up, before, but before it's fully ripened. Store the harvested fruit between 50 and 60 degrees in a well-ventilated area. Fully ripened fruit may be placed in the refrigerator to prolong keeping, but never put unripened tomatoes in the refrigerator. And then prior to frost, you can pick the green fruit and use a brown paper bag to allow it to ripen. It's time for a recap. Here's some information you might want to retain all in a nutshell from a four-page publication in the Home Garden series from the University of Georgia. In our video today we talked about growing tomatoes from seed or transplants we talked about the best environment for tomato growth, including a soil with a pH of 6.2 to 6.8. We talked about planting out tomato transplants. Remember, since tomatoes can develop roots all along their stems, do plant them deeply to encourage a strong root system. You can set your transplants down to the first set of true leaves very near the soil surface. We talked about the two growth types of tomatoes, determinate and indeterminate. Determinate tomato varieties grow in a more compact form and produce most of their crop all at one time. You can harvest all of the fruit in two to five pickings and then pull up the plants. Indeterminate tomatoes, on the other hand, set fruit clusters that continue to produce fruit until the first frost. We know that we need to stake and cage our indeterminate varieties because they do best when the vine types are given support. We talked about tomatoes needing about one to two inches of water per week, whether by rainfall or supplemental watering. It's best to do one to two heavy soakings rather than many light sprinklings. Do consider using drip irrigation or soaker hoses around your plants as this will help conserve moisture and avoid getting the foliage wet, which can cause disease. We talked about disease resistance. Because tomatoes are susceptible to diseases, viruses, and insects, some varieties have been bred or hybridized to be resistant to certain pests. Resistance to these pests is usually listed on the plant label using alphabetical abbreviations. Remember, disease resistance to these problems does not mean that they're completely immune and good cultural practices are still important. Speaking of disease resistance, we talked about some varieties that do well in Georgia, including the celebrity variety, the mountain series varieties, Big Beef and Big Boy hybrids. 
We talked about problems and pests with tomatoes. Although tomatoes are fairly tolerant of insect damage, they will occasionally have trouble from some common pests, one of which was the tomato hornworm. In addition, blossom end rot can be a serious disease problem with tomatoes. Remember, blossom end rot is induced more often when there's drought stress followed by excessive soil moisture, which reduce the uptake and movement of available calcium. Maintain soil pH between 6.2 and 6.8 for the best results. And if you have questions, please contact us at the information shared on your screen if you're local. Or if you've joined us from another part of the country, please contact your local county extension office. Thank you for viewing our video today. We hope you've enjoyed the Gardening with the MGs video and that you now feel comfortable to go outside and enjoy your own garden. Goodbye.